The Tswane University of Technology is in mourning following the death of a student from COVID-19. The university says as a result, it has decided to shut down the institution on a temporary basis as the infection rate spikes. According to reports, it's the second student who has succumbed to the virus at the institution. We're joined now by the CEO of Higher Health, Professor Ramnik Aluwalia. Good evening, Prof, and thank you so much uh, for your time. Firstly, let's just take a look at the response of, of TUT uh, to what has happened here. Is this the right response, given the circumstances? I think uh, uh, the, 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 the reality of young person dying of COVID-19 is extremely sad. Um, and, um, and, and this clearly gives us an indication that this virus doesn't spare anyone, you know. As much as we know young people are less prone to severe infection or fatality, but um, in reality uh, that the young people are prone to, the, to, to high severe infections is quite they are visible. I think the, the action taken by TUT is looked into a, a number of factors. And the most important factor that the TUT has looked into is, is, is the cluster outbreak. So there has been a cluster outbreak in Shwane University of Technology. And uh, we have seen uh, close to about 20 students who have become positive in just a period of one week. Uh, the death of this student was unfortunate. It happened last week. But the, the closure is predominantly on the ground of the current cluster outbreak. And there are multiple dimensions a university has to consider, which is linked to isolation facilities. It links to contact tracings. Uh, it links to how many students in the residences are in contact with each other and to give us time so that we can break the chain of the outbreak. So, so there's a multi-dimensional understanding of why the university has taken that decision. Um, and I'm sure the university will speak further on that issue. Um, but uh, the death of this uh, young child, a young person is very, very unfortunate. And it's a brutal reminder that this virus doesn't spare anyone. You, you know, it's interesting just the kind of conditions that you're describing at the institution, which, have, which would have necessitated that they take this break. Because on the other end of things, last year we heard uh, from from students who said that they, they, they you know they were they, they were asking to go back to their institutions of high learning because the conditions where they came from at least some of them made it impossible to be able to you know so social distance to be able to to self isolate and so it seems that they're really trying to grapple with with two problems at the same time see i think uh... <clears throat> Um, just to uh, just to before I answer this question, I think we need to understand that uh, we are currently in the third wave. You know, uh, uh, as much as data is suggesting that we are entering into third wave, we, we probably in the province of Kauteng or Shwane, we are in the third wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say this, uh, there are many factors that we need to look into what leads us into it. And then we had the first wave and the second wave where we had multiple outbreaks in many institutions, predominantly uh, asking the same question you have asked right now, which is the student understanding of when is the right time to be in the congregate setting like a university in the residences versus times when we need to really go into deeper understanding of to do some closures or restrictions, mm -hmm. as we call them. And I think at this moment, when you have an outbreak, so when you have a wave of a third way when the, the, the virus is moving very quickly from one human to the other human. Uh, we have a seasonal factor currently, which is winters where closed rooms uh, are, are highly prone. We, we totally understand this virus is now airborne like a flu viruses or a measles viruses. And this is where the closed rooms come into contact. And these are all the understandings that the institution um, and, and, and student bodies needs to realize when we take certain decisions on restrictions around what we need to do. And specifically knowing the third wave now around high contact moving around, the infection is moving from one person to the other very quickly. 
I think these decisions become imminent eventually uh, to, to certain situations and certain institutions. I would imagine that other institutions are watching the situation unfold. In as far as measures on campuses are concerned, is there anything practically that institutions of higher learning can be doing right now uh, outside of what they've already been doing uh, to, to make sure that their students are safe, their lecturers are safe, the rest of their staff are also safe? I think uh, higher education is uh, it's a very vulnerable space. Uh, it's a congregate setting. Uh, people stay, students are staying together in residences. They're residing together. They're eating together. Um, it's a space of classrooms where education happens. It's also the exposure of uh, thousands of young people to staff members or academics at the same time. Uh, we have institutions that can do online, but we have institutions that can um, cannot do online because there are courses that cannot be done online. Uh, how do you teach plumbing, mining in the TVET colleges, uh, engineering, medical sciences? So we have to look into blended learning and that's exactly what higher education is doing, which is the right way. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that uh, as much as this is a pandemic globally, it has now become endemic. And when I use the word endemic means the uh, in not only institutions of higher learning, but South Africa in general or the world in general needs to realize that we need to coexist with this virus. We need to learn to live with this virus. This virus is, is now in, involved into a human to human transmission. It's loving human body. It's loving to move from one human body to the other. So which means that the virus enjoys a human body and it tries to mutate, it tries to change its color so that it can escape immunity, it tries to formulate itself so that it can defeat a human immunity. And when you are coexisting with a virus of that kind, behavior plays a very important role. The only way we can defeat this virus is through breaking what the virus enjoys, which is moving from one human to the other. So the wearing of masks, the social distance, the ventilation of the rooms, opening the windows. Uh, winters is a very tricky time. We all are clustered inside rooms. We have closed our windows. And my room, my office policy is bring the blankets, bring your jackets, but open the windows. Because that's the only way you defeat an airborne infection like this. Mm. So I think that's what we need to learn as higher education. That's what we are preaching in higher education. I think higher education has done well so far, irrespective we have debts with staff, we've debts with students. Um, but in reality, we could save an academic year. We could conduct exams online as well as face to face for so many South Africans in rural South Africa or in, in, in peri-urban or semi-urban areas. So I think it's all about coexisting with this virus, understanding the virus, uh, building our management teams, building the frontline teams, and standing the academics and working with students on a social compact because the only way we can defeat is behavior change. All right, let's leave it there for this evening. Uh, that's the CEO of Higher Health, Professor Ramnik Aluwalia.